Okay, uh, it's uh, about 5 o'clock now, and there are there's a ton of material for me to try and get through. Uh, my name's Ashok, and this is about Drupal backend performance and scalability. Um, I've worked at the California Institute of the Arts as their systems analyst, and I have a strong interest in server optimization, both front-end and back-end. And um, like I said, there is a ton of material to go through, and I'm going to avoid talking about sof software that has some sort of successor, and I may have to speed through some areas. Um, I know this is the last presentation of the day, so if people are okay, we'll go over time, or um, when we're in the after dark, let's talk about this stuff, because this is something I, I love. And um, some of the sites that I'll be referencing are the main CalArts website that we have, which has, in my opinion, at times too many modules kept under control. Uh, our photo website with about 150,000 pieces of content, and the Zimmer Twins website, which I previously worked on, which had a million pieces of content with half a million users. And the presentation is not really going to apply to shared hosting, because only a part of this presentation, which might be code-related optimizations, might apply. And if there are any questions, just ask away. And if you have something to share, you know, just say it or come on up here. Um, there's plenty of room up here. And I'm certain there are some very knowledgeable folk in the room, so just speak up. Um, some of the resources that I'm using are Call It From Two Bits, who's done a ton of performance-related work, uh, the Drupal.org infrastructure group, and the High Performance group, uh, Peter Zaitsev for the MySQL-related performance optimizations, and Lullabot for, um, and for one of the setups on what you can have for um, a web architecture and plenty of suggestions from the rest of the community. I mean, there are too way too many names to name um, from this point. And much like the previous presentation, uh, before you start trying to diagnose and you know figure out what you want to do with your site, you need to figure out your goals and objectives. Are you trying to get a faster response? Um, is it more page views or minimizing downtime? Because each is different, but I mean, each is related, but it is slightly different. And, you know, there might be some simple things that you can do that will get you some great results. But once those are out of the way, um, it gets harder and harder to achieve even a little bit more performance out of what you have. And, you know, some of these things could include having more infrastructure, having revisions to the way your site's being architected, like the fields and views that you have. <coughs> Um, it could even involve patching, or the other word for it, hacking, Drupal. And once you have some of these goals in mind, you can start trying to do a diagnosis of what, what you're trying to achieve. Because it's essential before you start proposing and implementing some sort of solution. You don't want to be starting to do all this stuff because it's going to be like a chicken without its head. Um, you want it to be based on some sort of proper data, so that you can analyze it and have some paths towards that optimization. Um, there are obviously certain things that, you know, once you start doing them, you're going to learn it and then start applying it as you're going forward. But if it's something new and something's happening with the site right at that moment, this is a good thing to do. Um, and once you have, and to do all of this diagnosis, you want to be able to try and validate what's happening. So it's best to try and have some sort of test or development server where you can set up, you know, whatever your production site would be, all of that stuff. That's obviously, you know, a best practices thing, but when you're trying to do performance-related stuff, it applies as well. Um, you want to try and replicate all of the data that you have onto that development server, and I listed a couple of modules that can help with that kind of stuff, but, you know, you're essentially recreating the site. So the first thing you do is you gather the time difference between the test and the production server for any given page or, or you know, view or whatever you have. You just want to be, yes? How important is it to keep hardware on the test site? Um, the hardware is not as important as perhaps the setup of the server itself. Because um, like, this, like what I say, you want to try and gather what the time difference is between your dev server and your state server, and then you know just you, you just measure it again. So the re relative timings for all that stuff is remaining consistent. So then you know what if let's say it takes two seconds on your 
production server for, for some particular problem set that you're having, and it takes six seconds on your development server, and then you're seeing improvements on your development server as you're going forward with that stuff, then naturally you're going to see those same kinds of improvements on your production server as well, uh, provided that you know the rest of the architecture, all of that is the same. Okay. Hmm. Um, I'm not entirely sure on that one, but, but it, hmm. I think, well, yes, to some extent the hardware does make sense, I suppose, but, right, yes, that's, I think that, that's what I'm referring to, like, everything else on the server should try and remain the same, if at all possible. So then whatever kind of settings, all of that stuff that you have, it's relatively the same so that you can do this kind of benchmarking more effectively. If it's exactly the same system, then great. Then you're, then you're in perfect shape. Um, we'll just go through the different areas, um, like through the LAMP stack on what you can do, uh, the tools to measure and diagnose the issues through it, and the speed optimizations through some of that stuff as well. So when we're getting into the hardware, like it's been mentioned, the physical server does matter, uh, be it dedicated or a VPS or a cloud-based kind of uh, system that you're going for. And I don't know if there's anyone here to argue that cloud-based um, sites work or don't, um, since I think there are quite a few fairly large sites being hosted in the cloud at this point. And Multiple cores are the norm, so having 32 cores is going to be a lot better than having four cores in the system. Um, in the case of, of a Drupal site, in the case of most sites in general, having lots of RAM is essential uh, because, yeah, you want to try and cache as much as you can um, from the database uh, that, that you can do. And trying to split up the different servers that you have, like your database server, your web server, all of that stuff, into multiple disks is probably a good idea as well. Uh, you will see some performance gains from that kind of stuff. And SSD is much faster than a regular hard disk drive. And you might want to look into a something that Facebook had built when they started implementing SSD drives into their, on Facebook.com. Um, Fusion IO also looks really promising. It's, it's fairly similar in some ways to the SSD stuff. But tuning a database on an SSD is different from tuning a database on a hard disk drive. Um, just because of the way the data gets structured and, um, yeah, there, it, it's just different. So now we get into the LAMP stack. And that's traditionally how um, most of the Drupal sites have been hosted, and that's how most smaller Drupal sites are hosted. So you'll have Linux, uh, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and a chunk of the presentation will focus on the above, though as you start getting into the larger sites that are serving millions upon you, millions of users each day, um, we need some sort of acronym involving Varnish and Solar and Memcache and so forth. Like in this case, this stack right here, you can see that for Pressflow, it'll it'll go through. It'll try and go through Varnish. If it's hitting Apache, it'll try and serve the stuff, um, you know, that's in its cache. If it's going into PHP, it'll use the opcode caching. Um, it'll try and go into memcache first before trying to hit the database, and then once it gets to MySQL, it'll try and hit the query cache before all of that stuff. And then you can have Solar and all of that kind of stuff mixed in between there as well. So Van Lamp is one option. You can call it something else. That's just easier to pronounce. And I'm not really going to be discussing Windows since I haven't really dealt with hosting a Drupal site on a Windows machine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, when you're starting to get into larger and larger sites, you might be starting to think about having multiple servers for all this stuff. 
Uh, one simple setup might be having a master database server and then having multiple web servers. And then for the web servers, you can use some sort of load balancer like uh, HA proxy or some other DNS round robin or varnish. And you could also set up multiple slave database servers just to handle select queries. Um, so no inserts, all of that kind of stuff is happening, but that's where it's getting served from. But you can also, you should do it only if you have the budget and resources for that stuff, because complexity is expensive. Um, you know, there's a running cost, maintenance time uh, associated with all this stuff, and I'll share a story about trying to get a slave server for the database setup, which didn't work out all that well. And um, tuning a server, and while tuning a server can avoid or delay a split, um, there are sites that hit millions of users each day that um, run on one server. Um, there's an article by 2Bits where they have a server set up using one server and their site handles more than three million hits a day. And the link that I have in there is, yes, their setup's pretty crazy. And this setup here that I have is for Lullabot and what they have set up for hosting Grammys.com. So they have a whole bunch of CDNs into a firewall into a load balancer for, let's see, for Varnish and Memcache, uh, which then hits the database servers and then tries to do some of the queries off um, their SQL cluster or from their solar search. So there are a whole bunch of different layers that it goes through for serving the content and trying to serve as much of it in a cached form. And some testing tools that you can use um, I, I like Apache Benchmark. It's relatively simple, and it, it's relatively quick to do as well. Um, you do want to be careful with it, because it will do those actual requests on whatever site you're trying to hit. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm going to be sending, I'm doing a total of 100 requests to btmash.com uh, with 10 current, current users at the same time. So it's running it now, and at the end of it, it'll say um, how much time it took per request, how many requests could be handled per second, and so on and so forth. And since, like I said, it is doing it to an actual server, if you, if you go a little crazy with it, you could potentially bring it down. Um, I have done that, so that's why I, I highly recommend not doing it to a production site or someone's going to be really pissed off. Um, you can use JMeter, which is also similar to Apache Benchmark, and you can natively use it on Windows. And the nice thing is you can also test post functionality with it. So if you have some forms on the site and you, know, you just want to test it out, you could go through that and see what the performance is like that way. Um, since you are going to get a full Drupal uh, bootstrap and all that kind of stuff happening at that point. And um, for paid services, there is LoadStorm. And this is something that Lullabot used for the Grammys.com. And it's a web service to test out a site and, you know, basically try and hammer it out. And it gives uh, pretty graphs in real time. So for console monitoring tools, you could use Top. That's that's pretty standard for a Linux machine, and it'll give you you know what kind of command or what kind of uh, actions are running on the server, how much CPU it's taking up, the memory, how long it's been running for, and so on and so forth. And you can also set up different delay times so you're only uh, looking at the data as it's getting updated every n seconds if you wanted. And there's something called HTOP which is similar to top, but for multiple cores. And um, yeah, it'll give you how each of the separate cores are performing then that way. Um, for network statistics, you could use Netstat. Um, you could use ATOP, which shows, um, like it says, the network statistics that are there. I don't have it. Um, 
You can use VMStat to see how the memory is on your machine. Wow, I don't have it on here. And you can use NetStat to be able to show what kind of active network connections are there. So you can see which ports you have open and all that kind of stuff and how many things are connected in there at that same time. For graphical monitoring tools, you can use something like Cacti or Munin. They're both fairly similar to each other. And they're available as packages on Ubuntu and Debian and various other um, Linux and BSD flavors. Uh, they have fairly easy to understand graphs, and they can display a history over a day or week or month, year, whatever. And it has graphs that it comes with that will display certain stats for your CPU memory and all that kind of stuff. And people have also contributed graphs for other things that could be monitored, like um, solar or for varnish or various other things. So it's quite good for that. Um, Another tool you could use is Nagios, and I've heard it's very powerful, and it has a Drupal module for it, but it's also a giant pain in the butt to configure. Um, I don't know if there's anyone in the room that has installed it and configured it and all of that stuff. And how was it? Okay. Okay, it just reaffirms that. But, you know, it does have alerts by email and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, Lullabot has used uh, a service called PanOcta, which will monitor the server in the same way and show what the load is like on it. And, again, same kind of graphs that something like Cacti or Munin might show. And I've tried out New Relic, which um, they have a free version of it, and it shows the same kind of stats on it as well. And the nice thing with that is it'll show uh, where in your application the most amount of time is taking uh, uh, where in your yes where in your site it's taking the most amount of time so if it's inside the bootstrap function or if it's in somewhere else in your Drupal application you get some ideas of what's happening and if you're going to be using uh, most likely you're going to be using Linux and you want to try and use a proven stable distribution like a stable version of Debian or you know an LTS for Ubuntu or Red Hat or CentOS and you want to try and use a recent version because then that way you're going to get recent packages for all the different software that's out there as well which is obviously going to get updated and better hopefully better um, if you don't have control over it uh, you do however want to use whatever distribution your staff has expertise with so, as an example, I had more experience with Ubuntu, but the people I worked with at my workplace that were actually handling the servers had more experience with FreeBSD. So, you know, I could install Ubuntu on it, but if something goes wrong with it, it's on me. So, you know, until so it's better to rely on them, get their get their ideas, get their tuning expertise for that kind of thing and roll with that. Eventually, now we have started to move over into Ubuntu, so then, you know, we're all on the same playing field at this point, but, yeah. And um, you want to try and avoid bloat. So don't start installing Postgres on your machine if you're only going to be using MySQL. Or don't install, you know, the desktop server version of Ubuntu if you're going to be running a production site on it. And, you know, don't install Java if you're not going to have stuff like Solar and whatnot on there and balance compiling your own programs versus using you know packages because um, you know with the older versions of Debian and Ubuntu it did come with an older version of GD on it as well so it in some ways it made sense to compile your own version of PHP maybe but and but while it gives you full control it can be a pain to upgrade so let's start with Apache it's it's the most popular it's supported, it has a lot of features, and it also has a lot of modules that get enabled when you just start it off, especially on Ubuntu, like mod proxy, the CGI module, things like that might be unnecessary. So just disabling them will mean you have a smaller process, which means more users can access your site. If you run Apache CTL-M, it will show all of the enabled Apache modules that you have running on your server. So then you can just start seeing, hey, 
this is one that I, that I don't need, so just disable it. Uh, you can run Apache Talk, which will read and analyze the access logs that you have. And it's good for detecting, you know, the different crawlers that might be there and the command there, Apache Talk dash F will that's how that's that's how you'd run it. So if you're getting into optimizing Apache, um, you'd want to tune your max clients settings because if it's too low you won't be serving enough people and if it's too high um, if enough people come to your site you're going to run out of memory you will start swapping and then your server is going to start crashing and you won't be able to serve anyone so yeah you want to try and balance between serving enough people and no one uh, the max Right. Right. Um, a general way that you could try and estimate this is see how much memory your Apache process or your application is taking up. And then whatever amount of memory you have on the server or want to allocate towards your web server, just divide it by that number. And that's going to be about how many users you're going to be able to handle clicking on your site at the same time. So in this case, Okay. Yes. So trying to optimize it, of course, um, you get the memory itself. Okay. And just take the amount of memory application takes, so like 60 gigs, divide that by the available memory in the server. Generally, yes. Yes? How much does it that they first estimate the number of for a week, say, new 150 per It's it's one it's a it's a good beginning approach. Like it it'll give you some data about how it's going to perform, like you know, barring what the network connection might be like, all of that kind of stuff. It's something you have to keep into account. But the thing that you're trying to, in some ways, you're almost trying to test out how much, uh, how much of a beating can your server take before it goes down. Hence, trying not to test it on a production server. Um. Testing with, uh, you can try to tune the maximum number of requests each of the child processes that Apache creates will make. Because you can try and tune it so that it terminates the processes faster to free up memory for other things to try and take over it versus, you know, keeping it running longer and then just kind of accumulating more and more memory as it goes on. So it's something you can tune and see what works best for you. Um, keep alive. Just keep it enabled so that new connects don't get opened up constantly. And just have mod gzip or deflate enabled on it so it serves more content um, quickly with lower bandwidth. There'll be an initial uh, performance hit, but any subsequent requests to the same files, it's, it's not going to see uh, a decrease. It's going to be better. Um, once we start moving out of Apache, we can start looking at Nginx as an option for serving your content. It's fairly stable. It is more lightweight than Apache is. It is reasonably easy to set up, though if you've been using Apache for a long time like I have, you just kind of have to start getting out of that mindset, which is the hard part. Um, but with that said, it is reasonably easy. and. From the testing that I've done in our development environment, the results are looking pretty promising. Like the memory usage is looking lower than it did in Apache. Um, um, at least 15 to 20 percent. And it just seems like it's running better in general. I don't know if that has, I don't know how much of it has to do with Nginx and how much of it has to do with 
the fact that it runs PHP as a fast CGI process. Um, and it seems like the fast CGI, it running as a fast CGI process has a fair bit to do with it as well. Um, because Apache, by if you just install PHP, by def in, under most circumstances, it's using mod PHP, which does utilize more memory than fast CGI does. And, and like I say, underneath it, you can also use fast CGI with Apache. And that's the current method that the Drupal Camp LA website is being served in. And, you know, once you want to start stepping out of web servers processing and doing crazy, doing all that stuff with your server, and if you're serving a lot of anonymous users, you might really want to take a look at Varnish. Uh, it's an HTTP accelerator, and you can also set it up as a reverse proxy to send the call to Apache or Nginx or something else if it cannot serve something itself. It can serve anonymous page requests and static files. Um, setting, up, setting it up to serve the static files is really easy. And the anonymous stuff, uh, D6 Core does not serve anonymous pages through Varnish. If you want to do it, you have to use Pressflow. Uh, but with Drupal 7, Varnish and this play along quite well. There's some level of tuning that's required. Um, it's, it's just in the initial settings that you do, like how much memory are you going to allocate to Varnish taking up on your server. You want to make sure that it's not too high or your server is going to start slowing down. It'll still serve the content, it's just going to be kind of slow. And... And the two links that I have for configuration information, um, those are definitely worth looking at. But I don't see Alan in the room, but Riot Games does use it, and they serve millions of users per day, and it doesn't impact their servers a whole lot. And for this presentation, I set up Varnish on my own server, and I tried to start hammering the, the heck out of it with Apache Bench. And what I found was that I hit the limit on the server in terms of trying to hit it with a thousand requests per second for let me remember for thirty thousand requests, and it was doing three thousand requests per second, and it was just serving it. It was serving it just fine. Uh, when I tried to do it with my, you know, Drupal installation without Varnish, it was choking at about thirty to thirty-five users, uh, concurrent users at the same time. So, if you have anonymous users and you're serving a whole lot of them, Varnish might be a good idea. Especially since it plays along with Drupal 7 quite well. Um, some of the things that you can configure for it, I know it's a little bit... It, it takes a bit of understanding, much like Nginx does, to try and configure it. And what you would do is, for each of the different... Um, web servers that you have, you define a backend for it. So let's in this scenario, let's say I'm serving Varnish on the same server as my as my website. So I have backend and I'm calling it B1. The host is the local host and I'm going to be setting it to port 8082. And that's what Apache is going to be listening on as well. Um, you can have a whole bunch of these different backends for the different web servers that you have. And then what you would do is you would have this thing called director. So let's say director D1. And you can group the different backends together to have it in a round-robin process. So then, you know, people will hit your, um, hit your varnish server first. And then if it's set up to be in this sort of uh, round-robin thing, it'll just determine it on itself what to do. And then there are a couple of command commands that you have in there just to be able to figure out if you're going to be serving things through Varnish or if you're going to be serving things you know, outside of Varnish. So return pass will basically say do not cache any of the checks that you make that in this case contain Ajax in it. Um, it might be something that you don't want cached by Varnish so then you know it's going to keep uh, it's going to keep hitting the Apache server each time or Nginx or whatever. And return lookup will do a lookup in the cache or pass it on to the backend to try and get a cache to try and serve it. And this is an important, important line. Um, unset BE 
RESP, and I think it means unset before response, the, uh, the cookie that might get set. So this is what will actually allow the caching to happen. And if I, I'm just going to go to my blog for this example. Uh, let's see. Let me load it up using the, uh, the net tools. If I look at the header responses for it, I don't know if you can fully read it or not, but it will say that it was generated by Varnish and that it hit the cache with there. So that's how you can verify that it is going in through Varnish. And um, I've linked to two articles, one from Lullabot for how they set it up for having multiple web servers and one as a basic setup for Drupal 7. And yeah, like I mentioned, I tested it on my own blog with uh, stunning results. And once we're out of the web server, we start looking at the database server. And in most cases, people are going to be using MySQL. It's not necessarily the best one out there, but it does, it does an okay job. There, it's easy to set up, but especially in the case of Drupal 7, there is lots to tune. And the main reason for that is that Drupal 7 made the switch over from MyISM to InnaDB. And InnaDB is fully transactional, all of that stuff, but it's not configured out of the box when you install it on a server. And that's what requires all of the tuning. Um, I mentioned that there are various pluggable engines that are there for it, so you can obviously switch the engine that's going to be running for a particular table in your database. But again, all of those different pieces are going to require tuning. And especially with the way the development of MySQL went down, there have been a number of forks that emerged from the whole thing. Uh, MariaDB is one of the more well-known forks that's come out of it. It's, it was started up by the person that wrote MySQL himself. I'm trying to remember his name now. Monty something? Yes. Uh, Percona is another one, and per and um, let me remember. Percona was started up by the guys that run MySQLPerformanceBlog.com, and that's a great resource for looking at this stuff anyways, and Drizzle is a third one. Uh, MySQL 5.5, I'm not sure if it's fully ready yet or not, if it's out, uh, like as part of a repository that people can download from. But it's looking like there's a big difference. And it looks like there's a lot more to tune in it as well. Uh, specifically, the tuning seems to apply to having more cores on your server itself. So it's, it's starting to take advantage of that stuff. And most of these kind of patches are in MariaDB and Percona at this point anyways, since they're keeping an eye on what's happening with MySQL as well. So for monitoring MySQL, you should look at tools like MTOP or MyTOP. And it looks, it looks just like Topwood, but it's for MySQL. And it'll show you what kind of queries are happening on the server in real time. And that way you can kind of monitor whatever slow queries are happening or what tables get locked in the whole process and all of that kind of stuff. And if you want a poor man's version of it, then you just run show full process list on the server. But you're going to be typing that in each time. You can also use MySQL report. And I give the link for it, and um, it'll do reports on the server, and you know what what amount of memory is being used up, how much of the cache is being hit, and it's quite robust. Um, there is a whole lot of documentation on the website, and you just kind of need to read through that to try and understand what that report actually means. Um, finally, you can look at the slow query log, which can be enabled in your my. Uh, .cnf file. Uh, you can tell it to list queries longer than, you know, let's say two seconds, and list queries that don't have any indices. So, in my case, it helped me identify certain bottlenecks that were happening in on the Zimmer Twin site. Uh, one of them involved a bad count query, which I then, which I removed from it, and that that made all the difference in the world. Um, you can also look at using the MySQL slow log parser script. It'll just give you a better understanding of what the slow query log means. It can be a little bit hard for people to read through, so just like I said, 
something to look at. My top. It's a separate thing to install. If you're using Ubuntu or something, you can type in app get install and top. It's part of the libraries. Um, for my SQL engines, I think I'm just going to skip over my ISOM since Drupal 7 installs in a DB by default. Um, it is, like I said, it is slower in some cases um, compared to my ISOM, especially when you're doing count queries. And there are lots of settings to analyze and change. But you're going to get uh, better concurrency and you're not going to get these um, uh, collisions when people are trying to install or not trying to do the same kind of query on the server with the table locks and all that kind of stuff in place. Um, as I'd mentioned, there are forks. Uh, Percona comes with a replacement for in a DB called extra DB, and same with Maria. And they both look to be much better options than in a DB. Uh, they both utilize some of the patches that Google had recommended for including into MySQL, but hadn't been. And it has the same kind of tuning settings that InnoDB does. So if the distribution that you use offers it, it might be a good idea to check it out. So if we start getting into the InnoDB settings, like I said, there are tons that can be tuned. So I'll just talk about the ones that will most likely give you the biggest benefits. And the largest one would be in a DB buffer for pool size. Realistically speaking, whatever amount of memory you're going to be dedicating towards MySQL, you should set up to 80% of it towards that. Because that's where all of the tables, uh, like all of the stuff is going to get cached and get served from. Um, if the database is small, you could use the memory elsewhere, but like I said, just allocate whatever amount you have for the database towards it. Um, the InnoDB log file size is important for, si for sites that have a lot of writes happening into them. So setting it to be like 64 to 512 megs um, is probably a good idea. It's just something you want to try and test out and see how it works out. The InnoDB flush log at TRX or transaction commit, um, what, what happens by default is that after each kind of update you do on or uh, write request that you do to the, thing, to the server, it's going to flush the log that's on the server for InnoDB. And that can be an expensive operation. Uh, setting it to zero will mean it'll write it to the buffer but it won't do any flushes on the transaction. So, or you can set it to two, which will flush the cache instead of the disk. Um, and it won't do a flush on the transaction. And it's okay to be able to do these kind of changes because the disk is going to get flushed regardless every one to two seconds. So if something critical happens on the server, you might be losing minimal amounts of data. Uh, in the case of setting it to two, you're only going to lose data if there's a full-on operating. Yes? Does it make any sense to actually split your database by the type of data you have? For example, if you have glitches or large numbers of data, does it make sense to have a separate database with separate settings? I guess I'm trying to understand the question a little bit better. Do you refer to splitting up the database as a separate database server on a separate machine or as a, a separate, separate um yes you could have i'm trying to remember the in a db stuff you could have certain tables referenced on separate areas in your hard drive as an example to try and speed up the whole process as well um, I have seen people do that, and it seems to work to their benefit. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, moving out of InnoDB, um, you can tune the table cache, and what that'll do is opening the tables can be an expensive operation. So, 
having the table cache set to a larger size just ensures that whatever tables you had tried to open in the past, it'll try and keep them open for future connections that happen. Um, typically, keeping it at something like 1024 is a good place to start. It'll also try and keep some of the relationships between the different tables in there. So depending on what that is, you might have a relatively larger value in there uh, for it. Like some sites will have something like three or 4,000 as part of that setting. Um, the thread cache is if you have a whole bunch of quick connections, you want to increase the value. I think typically it's set to something like one or two. You could probably increase it to something like eight. I think you can do it on a per processor basis or something like that. Um, the query cache size will cache the query results that you have and generally you want it to be between 32 and 512 megs. Once you get above that point you're kind of wasting memory. Uh, you can use uh, MySQL report which I mentioned earlier to get an idea of what settings to tune or you can use MySQL tuner to help guide you in the right direction. Um, it'll start giving you various suggestions on what you could do on, you know, your in a DB settings are too low, increase this one, or, you know, you have too many connections that you're trying to accept on your server, just decrease it down, and so forth. And I highly, highly recommend reading mysqlperformanceblog.com. Um, there is a ton of material on there that you could learn for uh, regarding all of this stuff to tune out your server the way you, you want it to. Uh, you can also replicate your MySQL server. Um, it is used on Drupal.org, and they have insert, deletes, updates. You know, they all go to the master, selects go to the slave. Um, it can provide noticeable improvements. Pressflow supports it out of the box. Drupal 7 core doesn't, and or sorry, Drupal 6 core doesn't. Drupal 7 core does support it. But do beware of some of the complexity that can come from this. Because if some sort of, uh, I've experienced this, well, there were times when data would not be exactly the same between the master and the slave. Like there would be some sort of data error and the slave would go down. And then MySQL would try and connect to both of the servers. It couldn't connect to one of them. And then it would say, oh, the site's down. And that's the end of that. Uh, and this happened with the Zimmer twins. So then I went back, I did a whole bunch of tuning on the site. Uh, we were able to get a whole, uh, we were able to get some significant improvements out of um, tuning the master server that, and there were really big improvements that we didn't actually require the slave server at that point. Um, everything was just running off of one master database server and it's better. Yes? When you talk about, you know, replication of master and slave, you know, uh, you are talking about splitting the web and it's just sort of a database server. And what you're introducing is the network lag. What's that your experience, is. you know, on, on that? Yes, that's, that's a, uh, that's another thing you have to keep in mind as well. I mean, the first time when we had split off the web server and the database server, the uh, the network connection that was between the two of them, I think it was a hundred megabit connection or something like that. And what we found was that, yes, the server seemed more stable, but all of the requests that were happening seemed slower. And it wasn't until we realized that it is the network connection that's causing this issue that the site just feels kind of sluggish. Uh, once we increased that to a gigabit connection, the uh, the issue resolved itself. So yes, having a a uh, having lots of bandwidth between the two servers is crucial. Otherwise, it's gonna it's gonna feel sluggish. Even though when you start looking at the stats on the server itself, they seem fine. Um, at this stage, we're starting to enter looking at NoSQL database servers as well. Um, it's a bad moniker, or a document-oriented database might be a better term for it. And MongoDB is one of the better known ones uh, in the Drupal community. 
the nice thing about it is that the data gets stored in the sort of JSON-like format. So in this case, I have a, let's say it's information regarding a user. So I have their username, and their address itself is an object all on its own that's being stored as a part of it. And if I wanted indices, then I can, in this case, I have it on the username, and I have it on the state, which is inside the address object. So you can start referencing indices on fields inside the various objects that you have as well. And it already supports master-slave replication, and it has automated uh, sharding as well. So you could have a MongoDB cluster, and it'll automatically be taking care of the sharding and all, like, um, balancing out the data between them and querying the right server and all of that stuff with it. So it has a lot of advantages going forward. And the great thing about it is a module for Drupal exists. Um, if you go to drupal.org slash project slash mongodb, um, there's already support for, for storing the cache in mongodb, storing your fields in there, your blocks, queues, sessions, and your watchdog. It does a, a lot of the heavy lifting. And the examiner.com uses it and has disabled page caching despite the high load. For and the only thing is that for anything to get exported, let's say you have an older site and you need to export it into MongoDB, you're going to need to figure out how that data is going to get in there because it's not a simple mapping of the user table is going into Mongo as a user's table. You could do that, but you're not going to get all of the advantages that you might um, out of utilizing some of the stuff that Drupal does with it. Um, an example of this would be a node. You don't just want the node table because that node table just stores the node ID, the title, and a bunch of a couple of other little bits of information regarding a node. Whereas the node object has all the fields that are associated with it, the body, the you know, there's a whole bunch more information that you could have going forward, and you could have that entire object be inside Mongo. And then you could have indices on certain fields of those so that you could use it uh, effectively. And um, the way that you start storing data into Mongo, like the commands that you use, they're naturally going to change as well. Uh, you won't really be using db select or db update or db insert and things like that. It's all going to be have to be Mongo-fied to be able to do this stuff. One nice thing about Drupal 7, though, is that this uh, thing called the Entity Field Query came out of it. And what the Entity Field Query will do is it'll let you say, um, it'll let you filter for objects based on what kind of entity it is and what kind of uh, data you're looking for from the fields inside it. So you could say, when you look at the Entity Field Query thing, you can say, you know, give me all entity IDs that have uh, that are that are an entity of type node that have field date uh, for uh, August 2011. And the way entity field query works, um, it allows for the field, it utilizes whatever is happening in the field storage. And in this case, it'll end up using MongoDB automatically. So it's kind of platform agnostic. It's, uh, it's database agnostic. It could be MySQL, it could be Mongo, it could be Cassandra, whatever it is. Um, Entity Field Query will figure out what the backend is and send the query off and then give you back the results the way you need them to be. And you should look at the EFQ Views or Entity Field Query underscore Views project for promising work going into utilizing Mongo with Views. Um, wow. There's 10 minutes left. Uh, if we're getting into, once we're getting into PHP,